Coming up, Mayor Sly James takes his show on the road and talks about the state of the city at Park Hill High School. And speaking of shows, Kansas City will be in the spotlight for the next three weeks on the Antiques Roadshow. We were at Bartle Hall last summer when their cameras came to town. Plus, some boutique baking at the Farm to Market Bread Company. It's all ahead on The Local Show. Welcome everyone, I'm Nick Haynes. And I'm Randy Mason. You know, last summer the PBS series Antiques Roadshow, you may have heard of it, came to Kansas City and over 5,000 of you had approximately 11,000 items appraised in just one day. With the first of those three KC shows slated to air on KCPT Monday the 31st, we wanted to take you behind the scenes to meet some of the crew and see how they managed to turn seeming chaos into one of America's favorite shows. Working with producer Ashley Holcroft and cameraman Dave Burkhart, here's what our All Access Pass revealed. It might look like just another Friday morning at Bartle Hall, but that's all about to change. <laughs> Just a couple of hours later and look what a bunch of people with wrenches and drills and tape and glue guns, lights, cameras have been able to do. This thing is like ready to go in no time at all. Thousands of people are going to be hauling their canoes and whatnot up here. But right now it's pretty quiet. There's hardly anybody around. But the only sign of activity is over here where they've already brought in the furniture and a conversation is underway. Obviously, I have to assume you see that you all want to pitch a different piece. Yeah, right. Okay. Now, who got here first? Brian. Brian, you can pitch first. <laughs> Is that how it goes? That's Brian? how it's going today. <laughs> I would love to pitch this Regina. Okay. Months before the road show rolls into town, viewers submit photos of the heirloom furniture they'd like to have appraised. Today, the experts are getting their first look at what Kansas City has to offer. They've taken found objects. After hearing their pitch, it's up to executive producer Marsha Bemko, who makes the call on whether or not these items will be filmed tomorrow. This is great. There are three exciting pieces here already. Yep. So yeah. that is uh, a real treat. I guarantee we've never treat. done one of those. <laughs> um, now the director is. We get here bright and early, 5.45. We have um, time tickets, every ticket on the hour from 8 to 5. But believe it or not, people are very eager and they come early. You go right on up that way unless you have a firearm to check. I think that people would be surprised to see that uh, how big it is on Saturday and how it appears to be chaos but in fact is an organized mayhem. And it truly is thousands of people coming with items and from that we call a very few that we're gonna put on TV and bring to you guys. You know, at PBS we say, you know, this program brought to you by viewers like you. Well, there's some ownership there. So the people who come to Roadshow and most of them coming to Roadshow are standing in line are just so happy to be there and hang out with their other roadshow friends and um, kind of connect with that family. That the entire vibe is um, really relaxed and fun and energetic and a little goofy and it's a good time. It was in my dad's <laughs> office and then after he passed away, it's, I've, I've lugged it around for 25 years. It's pretty, <laughs> it's not worth much, but it is pretty. That is the very first day of the Cannes Film Festival in 39. That was the day that England and France declared war on Germany. 
what you got? I have an oil painting. Would you like to see it? Would you like to show it? Sure. Then, yes. This is a Julian Otterdant painting. You've got one. Well, I'm on TV. And you... <laughs> the biggest question we get is how do you choose the items? And people have really have no idea because they just see the items appear on screen. And sometimes it gives them a false idea that everyone who walks into the roadshow is a millionaire. A person comes up to you with an object. You ask them the story that you always hear on the roadshow, how did you get this? Once we hear the story, we're sort of the first line. We think to ourselves, this would be great TV. We say to them, would you be interested? Now, on the roadshow, you don't realize, but there are 70 appraisers at any given show. You've got 10 to 12, maybe 15,000 objects that come through, and you've got three producers who literally listen to all what they call pitches from the appraisers and decide what's going to make the final cut. So I have a lady sitting right here, and she has two watercolors by this woman artist named Maude Humphrey. And she had a very interesting career. She started out very young. But later in life, she married this doctor, and she had a son whose name was Humphrey Bogart. Oh. And it's a very interesting story. But they lost all their money, so in the end of her life, she had to, Humphrey moved her out to Los Angeles. She lived in the Chateau Marmont, and she would make a daily walk to Schwab's drugstore and like you know socialize with all the movie stars. But she kept working till the end of her life. When you see them, the quality is amazing. Okay. So where did you get these? Um, my ex got them at an estate sale. It's like a giant game of musical chairs. You're never guaranteed. It's really all about the object that comes in and the story that goes with it. So tell me what you brought in, please. Um, I brought in um, Judy Child uh, pots and pans, the copper pots and pans. When I'm interviewing somebody, I ask a lot of nosy questions. <laughs> I'm gonna find out how you got it. I'm gonna find out how much you paid. I'm gonna find out why your mother got it. I, I'm gonna ask the kinds of questions you can't ask in polite conversation. Did, when they asked you if you'd like to return it, did they offer to buy it from you or did they just want you to gift it to them? Well, and people are very sweet, by the way. They're very vulnerable in that moment. They wanna tell you their story. And they're very, uh, very sweet. There's a sweetness to this. All right, well, I am interested in taping you learning about your pots that Julia owned. Um, I am going to tell you something I tell all my guests who, when I confront something like this, is potentially as you tell your story about your history and how you came by the pots, if I were a really curious person, I might be able to identify who your mother was. So I'm going to mention that to you before you decide whether or not you want to tape. I want you to tape. So I want you to do it, but I want to sleep at night, so I'm telling you that. If they say yes to the guest, the guest goes off to the green room, we get an hour to research, and then we go to TV. And the next thing that people don't realize after the selection process is the fact that we get one shot on TV. There's no rehearsal, the guest has no idea what we're going to tell them, and they have zero idea of the value we're going to give them. And you want that reaction. Are we going to get tears? Are we going to get laughter? Are we going to get someone who's angry? You know, how are they going to feel about what, what we tell them? So one shot, that's it. And uh, so you try not to blow it. <laughs> it's such a simple format. and There's not a whole lot to watch except people talking and some items. But what I really think happens is that people flip through the channels and they see somebody talking about something that they own and then waiting for that little thing across the bottom to see if they're rich and then in turn is there a possibility for me. But the reason you stay is because while it's exciting to find out the value of the item, it's the story of the item and how this historical piece intimately connects to a family, an American family. And, and that storytelling is what I think drives the viewership. You know, it, it really, it's one thing to learn about history in books. It's another when you connect it to people's lives and to an intimate telling of how this item has survived all those years and how many hands have touched it, how many places has it gone, and how did it end up in these hands. And um, that's, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit of a romantic, but I think that's a lot of the, the, um, the appeal. All right, thank you. Now you've been through the process. Mm -hmm. Tell what beautiful watercolor by. His name, she corrected me, and it's, I think she said it was lost 
Phillips, not Gordon Phillips, which I thought it was Gordon Phillips. I also thought he was one of the Canadian Seven. She told me that no, he fought the Canadian Seven. So all around, I was completely wrong. <laughs> There's usually some people that are disappointed, and then there are people who find out that their heirloom is worth $100, and they're thrilled. So it's not really about the money, it's really about finding out what you don't know. Okay, you've been through it, you've showed it to somebody. Yeah, he said it's, that it's really playable still, and he said reconditioned a little bit would be worth about $2,500, so be happy. It is off a World War I era fighter, doesn't know what plane it is. He's in a shop and probably worth $1,500 to $2,000. At auction, maybe $800 to $1,000. A shop. Uh -huh. What kind of shop do you take a propeller to? I don't know. Propeller shop. <laughs> it was interesting when I asked my dad about it some time ago. He said, oh, we bought that at, at Paul's department store here, which I didn't know they had an art department. So this, this was part of what Kansas City was like back in the 60s. It's new art. I like to call it the History Channel meeting who wants to be a millionaire because you never know who's going to be the big winner at the end of the day, but you also never know what you're going to learn, either from the person who brought in the item or from the appraiser themselves. That's what I love about it. It's a constant learning experience and it's fun. Like a circus that's always in motion, the road show will, by the end of the day, be getting ready to say so long Kansas City and hello Richmond, Virginia the last of eight stops on this season's schedule. I think that it's bittersweet. I mean, we're all like we're still in full tour mode and excited about the tour, but um, it'll be nice when it ends to get back to the station and look at the footage. What you've seen here, this is a long time staff and crew. They know, and that's what I need to get this set up and down as quickly as we do. Uh, and it's hard, by the way. Just touring around the country and spending eight weeks on the road in the summer in a condensed time like that is, is, is taxing, but not taxing enough that you don't want to do it. This is special. Being a part of Roadshow is special. It's as special as it feels when you watch it, and nobody wants to miss unless they have to. You can catch all the excitement from the three Kansas City Roadshow episodes starting Monday at 7 p.m. on KCPT. But until then, we've also got a treasure trove of exclusive web extras for you. Everything from a couple who scored their tickets in the most unusual way to Mark Wahlberg saving a woman's life. <laughs> you can find them online at kcpt.org. Well, this week, Kansas City Mayor Sly James delivered his State of the City address. He certainly did, Randy, and with a big twist, he made his annual speech at Park Hill High School, north of the river, in front of an audience of mostly high school students. And KCPT streamed the address and a mini teen town hall meeting live to schools around the city. Students, uh, I know it's going to be hard, but I want you to close your eyes and imagine that at one point in time, I was actually your age. So I'm going to just tell you straight up, during the past few years, Kansas City has had it going on. We were named the top 10 travel destination in the U.S., one of six best cities in the country to start a business, and in the top 20 cities to raise a family. Also, I want to tell you, Newsweek also said the Kansas City's mayor uh, was one of the top five innovative mayors in the country. And clearly, they know what they're talking about. <laughs> but there's a couple of ways we can be tripped up when it comes to continuing our forward momentum. Now, simply put, our crime rate is too high and has been for far too long. So I'd like for you guys to do something for me. I'd like all the students in the room, look under your seats, please. And if you have a card under your seat with the State of the City logo on it, please stand up. Those people standing up represent 106 people who died last year in homicides in Kansas City. Now, now students, you with the cards, look on the back and see if you have a number from 1 to 90. If you do, remain standing. If you do not, please go ahead and sit down. 
The 90 people still standing represent the 90 people whose lives were taken by a handgun last year. 85% of the homicides in Kansas City last year were committed with a handgun. Here in Missouri, we must recognize that a one-size-fits-all approach to guns simply does not work. What's good for rural Missouri is not necessarily good for urban Kansas City and St. Louis. Crime, economic development, streetcars, all touched upon in the mayor's speech. Now, immediately after his address, Mayor James tackled questions from seniors at Park Hill High School in a mini town hall meeting moderated by Thank our you, Mr. Haynes. Slow. Uh, in the words of Monty Python, and now for something completely different. I should say this first of all, though, ladies and gentlemen, the last time uh, a man uh, tried to share the stage with Mayor Sly James at a State of the City address, he was wrestled to the ground. So I, I do feel blessed to be still sitting on this bar stool uh, this morning. Apology, first of all, from our students who had to rush from class to be here. They didn't have a chance to... Uh, dress up for this occasion. Uh, this is how they dress uh, at school these days, Mayor James. That's a good thing. That's a and, good thing. Uh, they're Especially taking, the bow ties. Yeah. Uh, this, if you want to be a future mayor, is how you have to dress, apparently. Yeah. Okay, Eric Krieger, also a senior, right here at Park Hill. What's your question for the mayor? I want to know how you plan to ensure that uh, Republican Party leaders choose Kansas City over uh, Denver, Las Vegas, and Phoenix for the 2016 National Convention. Wow. Um, <laughs> well, I, I tell you what, we're going to continue to do exactly what I think that we've been trying to do. We have uh, met with the Republican leadership on a number of occasions to try to impress upon them that if they want to come to a place that's got the friendliest people in the country, where they can do everything that they want, where they can go and visit all of the arts, eat at fantastic restaurants, visit fantastic museums, have a great time on the plaza, Zona Rosa, all over the city, go to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, and all the while know that they're being treated specially in a city, then Kansas City is it, baby. We've already shown that we can handle it. We did the All-Star Game. Everybody loved the All-Star Game. They left here saying, oh my gosh, I had no idea about Kansas City. They do now. This past weekend when we had the Big 12 tournament downtown, also had the Comic Con tournament, or a group of people there. They were kind of interesting. <laughs> they, they were. They were. They weren't wearing jerseys, but they were wearing some stuff, man. Where else would you want to go? Eric, you, you are the bosses here. This is the public servant. Uh, did he answer your question, Eric? Yes, he did. Thank you. Okay. My we're going to go to Andrew. Andrew uh, Jimenez, right at the front here. All right, before I start, I just have to say, I was at Comic-Con, it was great, loved it. <laughs> Flying Saucer is the best restaurant out there. All right, all right, I'm with you. <laughs> I, I don't know if that had a, I don't know, were you following a theme there with the Flying no, Saucer? No, or? it just kind of <laughs> tied in with everything. Okay, I got But uh, <laughs> my question is basically, the disturbances that happened uh, last summer at West Point or Westport and the plaza areas yeah. um, caused by young people. Yeah. What are your plans to fix that? Also, um, do you think that will happen in Zona Rosa this year? Uh, uh, and I should say for people, we are right next to, to Zona, Zona Rosa, Rosa right yeah. here at yes. Park Hill High School. I think the circumstances are a little bit more, uh, are a little bit different in Zona Rosa versus uh, the plaza, for example different types of stores, different kinds of clientele, different grounds, different rules for the grounds, very well posted, a very active on-site security group that runs around and says, what are you doing here? See you later, get, get gone. If you're not there buying something, then you're probably gonna move on. Plus the stores close earlier, so then you're not old enough to get in the bars, so you're not gonna hang out, all right? You're gonna go someplace where you can hang out. And all of you, do y'all hang out somewhere? Yeah. All get together somewhere? Where you get together? A movie? House. House? No? House. All right. All right. We can't simply throw kids out of places. We have to give them a place to go. And that's why we got started with our summer programming with Club KC, uh, with the night kicks, night hoops, night, night nets, and started to expand those programs. And what, let me tell you what happens during the summer months. As a direct result of those programs that we have, um, 
in the first year that we started, right after the shooting incident on the plaza, in that first year, juvenile crime, both victims and perpetrators, went down 16%, okay, during those times. In the second year, it went down 18%. That tells me something. Occupied minds and kids and bodies will do something more productive than get into trouble. If they're not occupied, then you're going to find a bunch that get into trouble. So give them something to do. The next thing that we're trying to do is we really, really, really need jobs. The city hires a lot of kids during the summertime. We had, I think we hired about 100 last year, give or take. But we had 350 show up for the interviews. What happens to the 250 we couldn't hire? What are they doing, all right? But we need parents to start parenting. We need churches to start churching. We need nonprofits to start nonprofiting. We need people we I feel need like this is a whole to different topic you're getting into. No, no. If we're going to deal with youth and the issues that we have with youth, we have to do that as a community. We have to, the city cannot take care of every child in this city. Andrew, were you satisfied with the answer? Were you expecting more something more? More than definitely. He explained it a lot better than what he did, than what I expected from him. Right. Very good. <laughs> well, I'm Mayor, not sure what that meant. <laughs> <laughs> well, these weren't questions like boxes or briefs, PlayStation or Xbox 360, <laughs> Mayor James. Yeah, I, well, actually, uh, I don't have either of those and boxers. Okay, all right. Yes. You can see the entire speech and the teen town hall meeting by clicking on the State of the City button on the front page of our website, kcpt.org. And we'll dissect the politics of the mayor's speech on Kansas City Week in Review this Friday at 7.30. And now from food for thought to simply food, one of the basics, in fact, bread. The kind that's made more by human hands than big machines. Kansas City's farm-to-market bread company was profiled recently by the public TV series America's Heartland, and we wanted to share it with you now, too. Thank you very much. You have a good day. See you next time. How do the baguettes look today? Mark Friend has had a love affair with bread for 30 yeah, years. Me, I fell in love with bread. Um, before I got, learned how, I, I tried. <laughs> I experimented with sourdough, and all I had was a bunch of stinky pots of uh, flour and water down in my basement. Following the teachings of some great sourdough bakers, he would later reshape those kitchen disasters into what Friend now calls farm to market. We were trying to find a name, and uh, Farm to market uh, was something that was suggested and seemed to fit uh, the idea of uh, uh, trying to source our products from the, our farmers that we would you know, have a relationship with. Farm to market wants you to know its farmers and the wheat they're growing. Back in the pantry, the ingredients have a distinctly Midwestern flavor. Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Kansas. What we're trying to do here is make a closer connection to the farmer. Like know who the family is that's grown the wheat, that's going into the flour, that's from the bread being sold at the store. This is a boutique bakery. Hands create the special breads here, not machines. Fresh ingredients are carefully chosen. Wheat, oats, raisins, sesame seeds. It's all important to Craig Flaker. There's a, a big creative outlet that's involved in this, you know, and that's where the artistic side comes in, the size, the volume, the crumb, the shape. Specialty products require a special commitment. Farm to Market bakes breads and rolls for 40 grocery stores and 90 restaurants in the Kansas City area. They work 363 days a year, taking off only Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Uh, what is your favorite? Rye, wheat, white, Probably dark. Wheat. In fact, we get a lot of grief because where's the ciabatta bread? Well, we brought in 20 loaves and they were gone by one and that's all there is. Many of the communities here, both in the city and rural areas, have populations that originally came from Europe. People of German, Polish, French, Russian, and Italian descent clamor you, for these hearty breads. Thank you. Armin Bagians gets handmade dough from farm to market and bakes loaves fresh at his store. Customer like that one because if front door customer 
walk in the store and they, they can look how I bake bread I put in the oven and how I take from oven hot. Farm to market completes a theme at the Hen House supermarket chain. Buy fresh, buy local, even to produce that carries the face and the name of the farmer that grew it. The average item in a supermarket travels about 1,500 miles to get here and these items are all within 200 miles. They have a sense that it's fresher and that, it, uh, that it's better for them. But farm to market is going even further, testing different ways to mill the flour, giving their breads different textures. It's easy to see differences in, in the handling char characteristics of dough. And that difference has led them to seek out farmers interested in milling their own grain. It's a big enough market now in the U.S. for artisan-style bread that, that there you know, needs to be a flour that's suited to that, too. But bread is sometimes a fickle partner. Our grain scalora, that's, that's one of our top sellers. Those who work closely with these ingredients from the heartland will tell you this dough is a living organism. An organism that lets them know every day how well they're doing their job. When bread comes out of the oven, it uh, you know, has this brown glow to it and uh, it's hot coming out of the oven. It's just incredible. You know, it gives you a good, it makes you feel proud. <laughs> America's Heartland is an ongoing series about issues and activities with agricultural themes. It runs Sunday mornings at 7 on KCPT and Sunday afternoons at 1 on KCPT 2. And that is all the time we have this week for The Local Show. Next week, we'll talk about the Middle of the Map Festival and much more. See you then.